Hi, welcome back to the Business Career College video series. This is Jason Watt, and in this video we're going to go through a fairly in-depth concept here. We're going to talk about investing using the corporation. Now this video links to a whole bunch of other videos, so you may find that it's most useful here to have reviewed the videos covering corporate taxation, and the holding company structure as well as business owner compensation. This is by no means easy stuff. This is among the most complicated concepts we'll work through and as always if you're looking for tax advice for your own circumstances you have to go and get that from a tax professional. As well a financial planner is going to be quite useful here. So here's what we have. We're going to deal with a straightforward opco holdco relationship. And I'm going to keep this easy here. We're just going to give ourselves one shareholder here. So we've got Steve up here, and Steve owns 100% of this structure. And for the sake of ease here, opco is 100% owned by holdco as well. And what happens then is opco generates some income. So we're going to say we have revenues here of 1 million, and we've done a very similar thing in a previous video, $1,900,000 and expenses in OPCO of, let's say, $1,200,000. And that's going to give us taxable income then of 700000 And some of that's going to be taxed at the corporate general rate, and some of that's going to be taxed at the small business rate. So we're going to end up with roughly $125,000 of tax payable. And we're going to have earnings then, bottom line, sorry, earnings of $575,000. We want to get that $575,000 somewhere where we can use it. Now, let's assume that OPCO has no opportunities to go out and buy another business or buy any sort of capital assets or anything like that. Basically, Steve says, I want to get that whole $575,000 up into HoldCo. I'm not interested in running a bigger business or anything like that. So now, we take that full $575,000 and it's ultimately what's uh, probably best considered a tax-free intercorporate dividend. The reality is it's taxable to Holdco and then 100% deductible, but for our purposes this works. So now Holdco, without paying any extra tax, is sitting on this $575,000 and we're going to have some of that in the small business pool and some of that in the corporate general rate pool. Not really a big deal. Let's say now that we decide, or Steve decides, or the board of directors decides, which is probably Steve in this case, that we're just going to dividend out $150,000 here. And maybe Steve already took some salary as well, but he takes $150,000 of dividends out. So now Holdco is left with, and of course that means Steve is paying personal tax on that. So now Holdco is left with $425,000. Now, why wouldn't Steve just take the full $425,000, sorry, the full five hundred and seventy-five, dollars basically clean out Holdco here? Well, this generates a tax deferral so that now Steve is not paying personal tax on these dollars. Essentially we're left with tax dollars that are roughly, call it 85 cent dollars, instead of tax dollars that in Steve's hands would be roughly 55 cent dollars, depending on the province of residence and so forth. And we're going to work with a BC example in a minute here. So we have some tax deferral here. This allows him to leave these funds in Holdco and he can invest now and he has more dollars available to invest this way. It's almost like he's treating Holdco as a sort of 
RRSP substitute. And because we've separated the assets of Holdco out from Opco, they are at least to some extent going to have some protection from the creditors, from any creditors of Op, sorry, of Opco. So we're not too concerned if Opco gets sued here about the ability for creditors to access the funds that are sitting in Holdco, although that is not bulletproof. It is, as I emphasize here, limited. And there certainly are cases in law where we see the ability to get past the Opco Holdco relationship and get access to some of these funds. So you have to be a little bit cautious here. And of course, you have to put in place proper insurance and make sure you're dealing with good, competent lawyers and all the good stuff that goes along with the normal risk management steps you want to take in any incorporation situation. So now, what are we going to do with this $425,000? Well, let's say that we decide to invest it. Okay, so we're going to invest it. And for now, we're going to buy, let's say, some shares of an unrelated company, a publicly traded company. And by the way, this whole thing assumes that the company that Steve is dealing with is a Canadian controlled private corporation. So we're going to buy these shares of this unrelated company. And what happens now is we're going to have an ACB of $425,000. Now, let's say that these shares pay this year dividends. And these are what we would refer to now as portfolio dividends. And they're going to be subject to part four tax, which is a very complicated structure. So these portfolio dividends now, what we're going to see here is whatever the return happens to be, let's assume uh, 4%, probably a fairly safe assumption. So let's call it $17,000 of dividends paid to Holdco. So these dividends are paid directly to Holdco. Now, this is a little bit complicated, but what's going to happen here is these dividends are going to be taxed at a rate of 33.33%. So we're going to have $5,666 of tax to pay. But with respect to these portfolio dividends, the tax here is all what's properly called Part 4 tax. This is our refundable dividend tax on hand, RDTOH, is how you'll normally see it's abbreviated, or refundable dividend tax on hand. And what happens now with this RDTOH is CRA basically takes this $5,666 and it's not really a tax that's payable. What it really is, it's a tax that's held by CRA until such time as Steve decides to take out a dividend. So we see that this year Steve took $150,000 in dividends. In any given year, any dividends that Steve takes would attract this refundable dividend tax on hand. So let's sort of isolate this out. Let's just deal with the $17,000 here. We'll come back to the $17,000, or sorry, the $150,000 in a minute. So if in the same year, so all in one tax year, and the thing to note here is this $5,666, this is not a tax at source, this is taxed at tax time. So it would be taxed as part of the corporation's normal year end, so the corporation files its tax return and they would have 90 days to pay uh, after their year end. So this is not a withholding tax. That is, at least in the short term, the corporation has access to the full $17,000. So in the same year, they declare a seven, the corporation declares a $17,000 dividend to Steve. 
And again, at a 33% rate, so 33.33% here, this is going to attract a $5,666 refund of any RDTOH. Now, if you have more, if this calculation turns out to be more than this calculation, then you only get up to the RDTOH paid. You can't get more than that. And you can grab previous year's RDTOH. So if you had some dividend tax that was paid in a previous year and not paid this year, you would still, sorry, some dividend tax that was paid in a previous year and you pay a healthy dividend out this year, you can still grab earlier refundable tax back. So what we're going to see here is that this ends up being a wash. And because of this, the corporation actually doesn't pay any tax. The end result or the net result here is that there is no tax to pay. Now, where is the tax paid? Well, when we pay this $17,000 dividend out to Steve, which is what we did over here, that's where it's going to be taxed. Steve is now going to pay tax as if he had earned that dividend at source. And keep in mind, the dividend would have been paid out of the after-tax corporation for, or out of the after-tax profits for whatever other company originally earned it. So we still stick with the theory of dividend integration. The total amount of tax paid by the time this gets into Steve's hands is still the same as it would have been had Steve somehow been able to earn that amount as a salary. So it really does hold up that theory of dividend integration that we're so familiar with now. Now a couple of other issues here. So if you collect those portfolio dividends, so if the corporation collected portfolio dividends and had and paid no dividend to Steve that year, well, that's where we have a little bit of a problem because now that RDTOH just does nothing for you. So the RDTOH is held by CRA, and it's sort of like putting money under your mattress. It just doesn't do anything. So the other thing to consider is this is one potential reason to pay some dividends. So when we're looking at whether you want to take dividends or salary, well, one thing to consider here is you pay some dividends to the shareholder, and that's going to get back that RDTOH. So that's something to consider as well. Now, we're going to work in a separate video with what happens as these shares grow in value because there are some further considerations around capital gains here. But what I want to walk away from this with is an understanding that this dividend taxation, this passive, or sorry, this passive dividends, these unrelated dividends, are going to result in this flow through mechanism where it's really for Steve. The same as if he owned the shares personally as far as how much tax he's going to pay, except that, keep in mind, he would have had more money available here. He was allowed to use this full $425,000 to invest now. If he had taken that money personally, he would have fewer dollars to invest because he would have had to pay personal tax on it. And then he would have less dividends. Those dividends would be taxed the same way. So this is a much better outcome for Steve in the sense that he has more dollars available overall to do something with. And we're going to deal, like I say, with capital gains in the corporation in a separate video. We'll use this same scenario when we get to our capital gains discussion. So I hope this is helpful. It is a very complicated concept. I expect quite a few people will want to watch this video more than once. I do understand the underlying complexity here, but I think we've done a good job of capturing all the basic concepts and I think we've done the math in a way that uh, makes sense and this is how it's done this is not uh, there's no fiction or anything like that here um, this is fairly representative of reality so I hope you enjoy your continued studies and thank you very kindly